to this uh, side event uh, on the issue of self-determination. If you would see our uh, flyer, uh, we have actually three uh, panel sessions, plenary uh, session, uh, expert session, and then the closing plenary session. Uh, unfortunately, there is a change in the program in the sense that uh, uh, Alfred uh, Desais, Professor Alfred Desais, together with uh, Adris, uh, uh, Al, um, yes, uh, Jaziri, uh, they are in the other event, which uh, was uh, organized by uh, uh, Professor Desais at the last minute. But they will be here. It started at half past two, uh, half past one. They would be here any time after half past two. So what we have decided, uh, the organizers here, that's Iram and Sisa. Is Fortunato is here or no? He should be. Um, what we have decided is that we will start with the expert session, and uh, uh, we, which is a, basically a review of uh, Professor Desais's work and uh, the way forward. So this session will be moderated by Ambassador Ronald Barnes. Uh, therefore, I will hand over him for the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, thank you, Majid, for the uh, opening statement and explanation. We had to change this at the last minute, and I got a call two days, so that's why we made this change. Today, we start with the experts. Um, I will begin with an explanation. We are here to not only honor Alfred uh, Maurice Desaius for his very good work, his six years as a mandate holder on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order. Of course, he was well supported by NGOs, by developing states. We gave him lots of support, signatures, and he was third on the list, but in the end, he was chosen uh, by the president to be the mandate holder in 2011. One of the big reasons why we hold him uh, endearingly for those of us who push for the right to self-determination is the paragraph 69N that came out in the year 2013. Could I have you guys silence, please? I'm sorry, sir. Yes. Um, and it's a very strong statement. It's very bold. And you don't get many special rapporteurs who have not only the courage but the boldness and the willingness to promote and support the fundamental principles of the United Nations, which includes 1.2. And if you look at the trail of the General Assembly provisions of the Charter, it's 1, 2, 55, 56, 73, 74, 76 of the Charter. I'm going to read out 69N, then I'll give you the first panelist. Uh, General Assembly may consider revisiting the reality of self-determination in today's world and refer to the Special Committee on Decolonization and or other United Nations instances, communications by indigenous and unrepresented peoples wherever they reside, inter alia in Alaska, Australia, Chile, China, the Dakotas, French Polynesia, Hawaii, Kashmir, the Middle East, the Moluccas, New Caledonia, North Africa, Sri Lanka, and West Papua. With reference to Chapter 11 of the Charter of the United Nations, we also worked hard so that we as peoples, he made a strong recommendation, that it was also very bold, and listen carefully. The General Assembly may also consider amending its rules and procedures to allow for the participation of indigenous and non-represented peoples. Meanwhile, the assembly should urge states to implement the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It should ensure that indigenous, non-represented peoples, marginalized and disempowered peoples, and peoples under occupation have a genuine opportunity to participate in decision-making processes. Of course, one of the bold things that happened during the deliberations of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples 
is indigenous peoples were able to interact equally with states and this somehow was seen as a precedence. So whenever we have peoples, non-represented peoples who are doing standard setting or setting uh, international framework for peoples, non-represented peoples, we found it very important that they have the right in the decision-making process not only to be consulted but to consent to the provisions that affect them. Of course, I come from Alaska. Alaska was listed on the list of non-self-governing territories in 1946 under General Assembly Resolution 66I, same time as Tunisia, Morocco, Indonesia. We were removed in 1958 by a vote of the United States military, American citizens, and even a Swiss citizen who went to Alaska and became a senator participated in the creation of a constitution. So we are looking to be re-enlisted as other cases, Hawaii and the Dakotas. So moving on to our first speaker, we have Professor Nazir Shal. He's director of South Asia Center for Peace and Human Rights. And he's a long time and well-known human rights activist for Kashmir. And he's been here many times, so we know his familiar face. Uh, please, uh, Professor Shah. Uh, Mr. Professor Shah, just one. Uh, uh, very quickly, you have the translation available um, in French and Spanish. Anna is sitting there. I can see her. Uh, so if you want to use this, what is the, what is the channel? Three, the channel, uh, Spanish will be two and French will be three. Okay, that is that. And also I want to say thank you to all of you for being here. I know you are here for uh, uh, Professor Alfred Desais. I, I see Princess Micheline there. She is a very good friend of ours, an NGO community, a strong NGO community member. And I see good old friend uh, Ricardo Espinoza here. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to all of you. Professor Scholl, sorry for intervention. No problem. Uh, Mr. Barnes, ladies and gentlemen, I am trying to place before you the case of right of self-determination as advocated by Dr. Alfred D. Zias. Dr. Alfred Morris Zias is an accomplished UN expert who has tirelessly worked in conformity with the requirement of his mandate and provided an honest approximation of the precept of self-determination as enshrined in the International Bill of Rights. It will not be out of place to mention that in the wake of September 11th, the trend among states has been to move away from the recognition of the right of self-determination as ordained in international law. His phenomenal contribution is that he responded to deepening UN acquiescence to the erosion of this basic right by seeking to reinforce its earlier understandings related to the right to self-determination. And in institutional options for conflict resolution and management between groups within the states, he has rightly advocated that self-determination is to be understood and seen as a conflict-preventing strategy. He has consistently held the view that the people caught in conflict situation should be allowed to express themselves in a fair and impartial referendum. Let it be left to the will of the people to decide what quantum of autonomy, internal or external self-determination they vouch. He also believes that human rights industry is a fig leaf 
the modus operandi of this op, uh, of this venture seems to freeze the human rights the layers and unequal distribution of wealth also doesn't escape his visualization when he advocates the concept of human rights to peace i heard him remark in one of his presentations that gender equality is a fascinating slogan but costing his observant eye on different structures he remarked how many females have been placed in the un structures it will be quite appropriate to refer to some of his key elucidations in the context of right to self determination the ones that sum up the concept of self determination tacitly are self determination is an expression of individual and collective right to democracy a violation of the right of self determination gives rise to legitimate human rights claim by individuals and groups and triggers state responsibility to make reparation self determination is now recognized as a principle of legitimacy underlying modern international law there is a consensus among states judges of international tribunals and professors of international law that self determination is not only a principle but also a right that has been achieved the status of just cogens there are multiple ways of looking at self determination one understanding of the right focuses on the legitimacy of choice so that every people may choose the form of government that it deems appropriate to its culture and traditions another perspective focuses on the right of two or more people to unify into one single state in its essence the right of self determination means that individuals and peoples should be in control of their destinies and should not be able to live out their identities whether within the borders of existing state or independence a look at the global arena clearly reveals this painful reality that there are many conflict areas with echoes of pain and agony denial and deprivation of rights appalling poverty social injustices draconian laws and overriding undemocratic structures there are areas in the world where people desire to become the masters of their destiny and the underlying predicament and the principle for any self governance is self determination i come from a place which is being occupied by india which in the eyes of the world is the largest democracy conducting the biggest human right violations the world and fully endorse a court of former prime minister of india dr manmohan singh in his speech to the united states congress during his visit to the united states describing democracy he said the real test of democracy is not what is said in the constitution but in how it functions on the ground European ad hoc delegation that visited Srinagar in 2003 rightly classified the functionality of Indian democracy in Kashmir as a beautiful prison having no intention of using rhetoric but if the siege of army is lifted and the people provided a political space as advocated by the independent expert the will of the people will be manifested through a referendum which is being denied to the people of Kashmir an ostrich like approach does not solve problems and it is time to international community that it acknowledges the gravity of kashmir dispute as it continues to perpetrate the south asian regional cold war where the international community and all well wishers of peace would like to avert another war on kashmir now i am i will conclude because i have already received a slip the kashmir dispute has not been settled by united nations but i have a firm belief that it will never be settled without united nations and by settlement not a hollow truce or a patchwork arrangement but a comprehensive agreement which can be called the realization of self determination
a referendum as proposed by Dr. Alfred Zias is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shaw. Um, that was very good uh, background about some of the problems that you face in Kashmir. So the next uh, panelist on the list is Rania Mahdi. She comes from Palestine and she's a UN legal consultant with the organization Badil, which is a resource center for Palestinian for human rights. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Madame Mahdi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everybody, for attending and supporting this panel. Uh, in fact, Badir, which is mean alternative in Arabic language, and alternative because our organization working to found alternative how to keep the concept of the question of the refugee, refugees and internally displaced persons in the really the whole issue. Because you might know that the three, the third, of, no, the three part of the Palestinians, I mean, they are considered refugees or IDPs, which is mean there is eight million outside Palestine who have no right to return back, and two and a half million uh, who are really inside the occupied Palestinian territory. And I want to remind you as well that in December 2017, the UN General Assembly with a majority of 176 states, they vote in favor of the Palestinian right of self-determination. So it's not new. This has uh, happened like uh, uh, yearly, and even here in the Human Rights Council, uh, each time the Palestinian Authority, they present the resolution, it's voted in favor. So if I, wa I don't want to go through this academic uh, uh, definition of the right of self-determination, uh, because I think my colleagues uh, have already bring the issue, and uh, just to remind you that the question of Palestine, it's among the really the longest, which I don't want to say forgotten, but it's unsolved problem till now. And this is a shame. It's a shame for the international community. It's a shame that till now, the oldest uh, occupation still exists, and it's became more and more really harder. If I want to bring the issue, why till now, the Palestinians, they didn't really get this right, you know. First of all, you have to, uh, I have to remind you of many resolutions as well in which the settlements have been condemned by, I mean, international law professors, European, uh, the European unions and other entity, even in the UN. Why? Because the settlements, in fact, it's not just really, it's a residence which have been built to locate uh, the Jewish or the Israelians or the others. First of all, the settlements based in occupied territory. And according to international law, it's forbidden to displace people from the occupying power and to put them in occupied territory. Secondly, also, there is the issue of forced population transfer of the Palestinians. Because when I want to build these settlements, first of all, I confiscate the land. Then I control the natural resources. Then I uh, um, demolish houses, in which I want to remind you this year, no, sorry, 2017, there is 176 houses have been demolished. 13 of them were in Jerusalem. And others have been completely occupied by the settlers. And I prepared a five minute uh, video for the city of Hebron, but the time is short and I have just five minutes, so there is no time really to use it, in which you can see the whole city, the whole center of the city completely occupied by the settlers. So the main road where there is all businesses, which is really to feed and to help the Palestinians. And you may know that we don't have independent economy because we are under occupation. We don't have any right to control any of our borders. And here I bring either the, I mean, um, the borders with Jordan, the borders with the other part, or the borders of the north. That it's all controlled by Israel. Some people, they think that since the recognition of the Palestinian state, that the Palestinians are control their borders, but absolutely not. Even the president, Mahmoud Abbas, if he want to leave the territory, he should have a permission of the Israelis. So you can understand the issue. If you want to export or to import any product, then it should be really 
um, agreed by the Israeli authority. And sometimes, like now, we heard that the Israeli, they prevent the Palestinians to get that back the money of the taxes, which is mean, like, we control how much money you have to get, which is mean we can't pay the salaries of the people. So in these circumstances, how we can really implement the right of self-determination? OK, I support also the other cases in the panel. And yesterday, I said in the panel that there is similarity of what's happened in the Kashmiri who were under British mandate and the Palestine as well. So they left, they finished their colonization, but they left other problems, which is still now unsolved. So this is, I think, one of our recommendations should be after the end of this panel that we should disagree that this, I mean, problem still unsolved. It's really a shame because now there is other new issues. And I here, I want to put you, just to give you one example. A Palestinian who was forced to leave Palestine in 48, then he was in Syria, then the war was in Syria, then he left Syria to Jordan, then he has no permission to live in Jordan, then he went in Yemen, and now Yemen is a war, or other. This is just one example of the cases. So you can imagine the 8 million of Palestinians who live abroad, they pass through this, really, this issue. So I thank you very much for your support, and I will be here to answer any question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Sorry. you very much, uh, um, Madame Madi, for your explanation of the current struggles of Palestine today. And you, you seem to bring in an, a new dimension because Palestinians, as you say, have been placed all over the world and find themselves in different war zones and situations as a matter of being displaced international from their home, original home territory. Uh, the next uh, panelist we have today, I'm going to give it to uh, um, move down the list because we're waiting for Fortunato Escobar and we may have to place Mr. Uh, Tomas Kandori if he doesn't arrive. So right now I will give it to Mohammed Arku Arkuku and he comes from Western Sahara. He's uh, based in the United States of America is a very strong activist who's been promoting the rights of the uh, Western Sahara peoples as they exercise fully their right to self-determination under international law as a peoples who strive for independence. So I give you the floor, Mr. Arkuku. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's it, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. First, my name is Mohammed Ali al Kuku, and I am from the last African colony, Western Sahara, and I am a Sahrawi activist, and I am founder and uh, the chair of the Sahrawi Association in the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, as it's known, in 1963, while under Spanish control, Western Sahara was officially recognized as a non-self-governing territory by the General Assembly of the United Nations. Instead of completing the process of decolonization and organizing a referendum as it was promised in 1972, Spanish betrayed its international obligation and let Morocco and Mauritania invade and occupy our country under the so-called Madrid Agreement of 14 November 1975. This invasion happened despite the ruling of the International Court of Justice in October 1975 that confirmed the legal right of Sahrawi to process of self-determination and find no tie of sovereignty between Western Sahara and either Morocco or Mauritania. This invasion sparked a brutal and bloody war against the Sahrawi people. It ended first when Mauritania signed a peace agreement with the Polisario Front as a legitimate representative of the people of Western Sahara. Second, when Morocco accepted the peace plan that, organized, that recognized the right of Sahrawi people to choose freely their future through a referendum of self-determination. This referendum should have happened held six months 
after the entry into force of the ceasefire on September 6, 1991. 25 years passed. We, as the Sahrawi people, still waiting for the international community to deliver what promised us. During the time of invasion, as in establishing its control of part of Western Sahara, Morocco has violated all international human rights laws, including the, the Geneva Convention that protects civilians in time of war. As an eyewitness, I had the opportunity while I was living in Layoun, the occupied capital of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, to hear a testimony of Sahrawi nomad who survived the atrocity of Moroccan army forces. How some of them miraculously were spared from being buried alive in massive grave south of Smara. I had also the opportunity to know from survival of notorious secret detention facility such as Qalat Maguna Agdes Pisissimi in Layoun how a peaceful demand of a free Western Sahara could cost a Sahrawi civilian over a decade of harsh treatment. Based on international NGOs, such as Human, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, dozens of Sahrawi died during this period and dozens of them still unaccounted for. This systematic human rights violation continue to happen now, but Morocco succeeds to hide them because of his successful media blockage and the ban of international independent media and NGO to enter the territory. As an eyewitness, I saw on a daily basis the plundering of our natural resources, whether the sand stolen from our shore and shipped to the Canary Island, the thousands of tons of phosphate shipped from the Ayoun port to all over the world, and hundreds of trucks loaded of fish traveling north. Starting in 1991, and even before, the demographic of the occupied Western Sahara started to change dramatically and how Morocco start to encourage the Moroccan settlers through economic and financial grants to settle in Western Sahara. And to go back to our, my colleague, the Palestinian, how ironically, how ironically the United Nations is denouncing the Israeli for building the settlement in, and, 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 and encouraging the, the Israeli settler to settle in, uh, in the occupied Palestine, but not ever for Morocco. Why? Because Morocco always succeeded during 1975 to block any media or an NGO to get into Western Sahara. That's why the demographic of Western Sahara had changed demographically and the Sahrawi uh, indigenous became very minority in the occupied Western Sahara. And of course, hundreds of thousands of them are displaced in the refugee camps in southern, in southern Algeria. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sahrawi people are still waiting for the international community to, to fulfill its promise by giving them the right to self-determination through a referendum. And we would like the UN General Assembly to determine a date for that. We, the people of Western Sahara, asking for immediate stop of the plundering of our natural resources and our knowledge the 21 December 2016 decision of the Court of the European Union that Morocco has no sovereignty over Western Sahara natural resources. The same decision was reiterated on February 2017, uh, 20, uh, February 20, 27 on 2017. We, the people of Western Sahara, are asking for the immediate and unconditioned release of all Sahrawi political prisoner. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to stop you here and to let you know that as of now, we have dozens of Sahrawi political prisoners in open hunger strike. Their health is deteriorated. I'm talking about uh, the Gdemizik group or the, the students who were arrested in Moroccan jail and dispersed everywhere. Why they were arrested? not because they are fighting for Moroccan democracy, not because they are asking for, uh, for, uh, for, for some, some kind of economic uh, privileges, but their main reason of arrest was because they are asking for the right 
of the Sahara people for self-determination and free Western Sahara. That's why we ask for the immediate release. We are demanding for that the expansion of the MINURSO, the MINURSO mandate to uh, monitor the human rights whether in, in, in the occupied territory on the refugee camp. And I thank you very much. I thank you very much, um, um, Mr. Mohammed Arkuku, for your presentation and giving us some of the background and the current uh, challenges that you, ch uh, you experience today. I want to say one thing because this is always said in response to the situation of Western Sahara. It applies to self-determination and also to Alaska, Hawaii, and many other cases that can apply this principle. The territory of a colony or other non-self-governing territory has under the charter a status separate and distinct from the territory of the state administering it, and such separate and distinct status under the charter shall exist until <clears throat> the people of the colony or non-self-governing territory have exercised their right to self-determination in accordance with the charter and particularly its purposes and principles. This is very important. We always assert this coming from different non-self-governing territories who have yet to exercise their self-determination. Um, Tomas, you could come to the podium if es Escobar is not here. Yeah, um, but right now I think I will hand the floor over to my very good friend, uh, distinguished Dr. Astrid Stuckelberger. She's a representative of the Society for Psychological Studies of Social Issues, and she will speak to some of the issues that we experience for peoples under colonial domination and occupation. Uh, thank you, uh, Ron, thank you, Majid, and uh, I want to first congratulate uh, uh, the, the mandate of Alfred Desayas uh, and all the work he has accomplished to, to this date. Um, I'm going to, um, as, a, as a scientist and a specialist on uh, public health, mental health, and psychological human development, uh, I have already spoken to a panel on self-determination with a very new approach and on a panel on, on children's soldier that I think needs, and that will be a recommendation to be integrated in any discussion where humans uh, are denied their rights and where there is violence against their human realization. So I will, I will just, uh, because I don't have much time, um, give you some thoughts, that scientific thoughts, <laughs> that might uh, trigger in you a new dimension uh, of understanding the issues and problems around self-determination. Self-determination is not just political and not just human rights. Uh, Self-determination is part of the normal tendency of any human beings in this room for self-development and self-realization. So when we talk of self-determination and of human rights, we are talking of the human and we are talking of the human in the rights. And this, where there is a, a kind of contradiction is that self-determination is first an individuality, human rights is an individuality, but at the same time it is a collective realization. And this collective self-determination is sometimes in conflict with the individual self-determination. And this is maybe something to understand better. There are lots of studies on the trauma of denial of self-determination. There is a lot of denial on the violence uh, done to people when stopping their human development, like in child soldiers. But there is not enough studies on the factors that make a person traumatized. There are not enough uh, studies on the consequences and the rehabilitation that is almost non-existent at the human level after a conflict and after a war. The psychological development and rehabilitation is, is an aspect that is not uh, considered. Why? Because you can't see it. You can see a broken arm, you can see a broken leg, you can see a physical trauma, you can see somebody in prison, you can see torture. But what you cannot see is the devastating consequences and long-term consequences of somebody denied its rights and denied its existence, like stateless uh, people, uh, 
psychologically, it's not seen, and uh, socially, because they don't exist in society, they cannot have a, a work, they are, they are always uh, imprisoned, and I think some people here know about that. Uh, they are a, a prison in society, a prison in themselves, and they are limited in all the movements they have. So if we look at the self-determination consequences of denying those rights and losing those rights, you are actually cutting off a human being from its uh, first tendency is to self-realize itself in peace and in, in, in development. So uh, what I want to just uh, mention without going into details is that there are many aspects that need to be studied in self-determination. Um, first, there is the situation of armed war and unarmed war. Then there are typologies uh, of that, that don't exist and should need to be done. Um, the style of the, uh, the, the style of non-self-determination, what population, it can be at the individual level, it can be groups within a population, uh, like uh, children, like children soldier, it can be um, the women, can be now, you know, they use the self-determination um, um, name also. But the, the, the typology is really lacking and we really need to make more sense out of uh, all, all the, the ways that self-determination is addressed. It can go also from uh, people in the gulag, it can be uh, the terror war, the war on terror, and things like that. So one aspect here is that uh, we need to look at the stage of life when it happens. We need to look if it is uh, cumulative and for how long, and the intensity of the trauma that the denial of self-determination is doing. For that, after that only, will we be able to address this in a more coherent way and to help this self-determination denial to be visible at a more comprehensive level, not only in the department of, of, of legal department, but also in the social department, in the <laughs> economy department, and how it's been mentioned here. So uh, maybe my recommendations, I don't really, uh, I know what I've done. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, what we need to uh, to look at is, is that on, on the scale, it is like in a pandemia, you need to look at what triggers the denial of self-determination collectively and individually, then to look at the impact it has on at many levels, first on the physical level, and you can see that rehabilitation on that level is addressed, kind of. Then you can look at the psychological trauma and the PTSD, if you don't know what it is, it's a post-traumatic syndrome, is the most known and documented trauma for human beings after a war, conflict, or an un unspoken war, or under a genocide, or it is a trauma that is collective, not only individual, and we need to also uh, look at that. And then the, the third is the social, which is a bit more visible, but we don't talk much about the social rehabilitation of individuals after the denial of their self-determination. Um, I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking, and then you have the political. Uh, I'm thinking of Pujimon because it's a very interesting case. Uh, he is trying to do self-determination in an individual now way, in a collective way, but socially he's out of the system, and at the same time he is in the global system. So in fact, the human rights uh, instruments are giving humans a possibility in this global world to act individually and collectively uh, and, and start to be visible. And we need to take case studies to show how this mechanism is working and where it's not working and where it is working if you want to make a real change uh, in the future in the strategies, not only looking at human rights, but looking at the behavioral, social behavioral, and psychological uh, system. Now, just a few recommendations, because as you understood, there are lacks, uh, lacking a lot of uh, uh, data is lacking, um, a lot of instruments are, are, are lacking to understand better self-determination, denial, and violation uh, of human rights. Um, but what I would just want to say, that first, we need to have more data, more collected collection of data, of case studies, and to conceptualize this better, to understand humans and how it is acts and collective also uh, population. Then the second is that we need to study better and understand better the consequences at all the levels I have mentioned, the visible and invisible uh, harms. And then the third is the rehabilitation. And like for the child soldiers, which really uh, made it clear to me that the rehabilitation can take a long time and it is just not individual, it is social, it is familial, it is cultural, and uh, we need to think more uh, Koreans. And the fifth is that this uh, recommendations cannot just go um, 
in science at all. It is a multi-level and intersectoral approach that we need to do in a comprehensive way with many sectors and not just the human right and legal uh, aspect. So for that, uh, I think, and this is a hope I have, is that maybe self-determination will be the beginning of a global democracy uh, that is going uh, to go uh, for the best of human, individual, and collective development uh, for peace. And I want to just mention uh, Antonovsky, who is a psychologist very known for his work on the sense of coherence. And having a sense of coherence in your life uh, brings you to self-realization, happiness, and health, and a, a global, a good economy for the state. And we need to put sense of coherence in the self-determination and the people who are denied the self-determination, but also at the collective level, we really need to make sense of coherence uh, to, to align ourselves with the UN and the human rights instruments that are there for development and peace, after all, of the human. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Astrid, for bringing in the psychological aspect, which you can also attach to the principles, as she said, uh, that were created by the United Nations General Assembly. They have a set of factors and principles and human rights principles. Because if we are not able to know, speak on the matter of our right to self-determination and to know the consequence of our decision-making, then we are paralyzed, not only psychologically, mm -hmm. economically, and there's a many social, there's many factors. Okay, so the next uh, person we, uh, from the Indian Council of South America, is uh, my good friend, I've uh, known him for many years, I, and he's the permanent representative of CISA, He's formerly a professional musician. He's been in this, uh, I've been around town where I've seen an old album of him from the 70s. And so he's a professional musician making CDs and spoke in WIPO and many other places since 1977. So I present to you uh, Mr. Tomas Kandori, one of the sponsors, uh, co-sponsors of this event today. Buenas tardes, señores. Eh, me llamo Tomás Condore, eh, representante del Consejo Indio de Sudamérica. Este consejo se ha creado en el año 1980. En 1977 llegamos aquí a Naciones Unidas para pedir la justicia de todos los pueblos indígenas. También eh, quiero decirle una cosa que es muy importante. El organizador de este evento se ha equivocado el nombre del CISA con el nombre del a quien a un hermano, no lo niego, es un hermano indígena de Alaska, pero le han puesto CISA como si fuera representante. Y no es verdad, es un amigo aliado de nuestra organización UNG. Nosotros somos de UNG desde los años 1983 que hemos recibido. Hemos venido a Naciones Unidas a pedir un estatuto de, de observador, no una UNG, simple UNG que podemos reclamar nuestros derechos, sino nosotros somos, nos consideramos las primeras naciones en, en Sudamérica, porque somos dueños de nuestras tierras y territorios y de los recursos naturales. Hoy día están explotando la, la, la política eh, invasores que son de, del, del occidente, que son dueños ahora. A nosotros nos desfojan de nuestro territorio, nuestros recursos naturales, ellos explotan. Y a nosotros nos consideran somos pobres. Claro que somos pobres porque eh, no tenemos ese recurso que ellos explotan, porque el petróleo, el oro, estaño viene de, de Bolivia. Yo soy boliviano en pasaportes, pero mi origen es Aymara, un pueblo de milenario que exist, existió. Cuando llegaron los españoles, nosotros ya hemos ido a pueblos y naciones 
Ahora ellos se ponen de naciones, los sudamericanos, su gobierno dicen somos nación peruana, nación boliviana. Ellos no son naciones, ellos son estados que se plantean con, a la fuerza militar. Entonces son estados que se dominan a nuestro territorio y nuestros recursos naturales. Aquí está, venimos, venimos ahora para defender los derechos humanos. Sí, hay que defenderle, hay que discutir con los estados, hay que de, relacionar con los estados que consideren a nuestros vivencias. Si no, si no nos desfondos, vamos a seguir viniendo aquí a pedir y nos vamos a cansar y vamos a perder. Entonces, en este caso, Naciones Unidas también puede perderse, porque nosotros también somos una fuerza del, del, del origen con con un, recursos naturales, así que tenemos que tener una defensa de derechos humanos que sea justo para todo el mundo y mundialmente, que sea respete a los derechos. Hay que hacer respetar desde nuestros hijos hasta nuestros abuelos que, que tienen que conocer eh, la Declaración Universal de Derechos Humanos. Eso es importante que tenemos. Y por eso estamos aquí, tenemos que discutir con los estados. Ahora tenemos la Declaración de Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas, que no está respetado y los estados no han firmado todavía, tienen que firmar. No han firmado porque es, no, nosotros, ellos se consideran también dueños, ahora nosotros también nos consideramos los primeros dueños de nuestro territorio. Ellos son segundos dueños, entonces, eh, ¿qué hacemos nosotros aquí? Entonces, nosotros tenemos que venir aquí como empleados, como sirvientes aquí para decirles que sí, que me perdone o no. no a nadie vamos a perdonar. Nosotros también somos, tenemos derecho. Nadie debe perdonarse porque los derechos humanos no se perdonan, se, no, se respetan. Eso hay que tener en cuenta. Eso hay que saberlo. Eh, todos los pueblos también tienen que defenderse a sus derechos. Y todos los países deben luchar también. A todos. Nosotros, pueblos indígenas, no luchamos solamente para, con los estados, porque hay dos grupos de Occidente, la derecha, que se dice que son los uh, patrones, y la izquierda también, que es otro grupo, también se eh, digitado por otras organizaciones eh, religiosas para poder dominar. Entonces, en nuestro territorio se disputan dos grupos políticos. Eh. Para nosotros no, no, no es político, sino que son unos invasores. Político es un grupo y otro grupo que se pelean. Entonces nosotros nos consideramos como los pueblos habitantes de la región. Con derecho te estamos aquí para poder luchar. No venimos a pedir perdón aquí a Naciones Unidas, sino que tenemos que dialogar, tenemos que luchar. Para eso estamos aquí. Y queremos que todos los pueblos que sean que sean claros con su lucha, no venir aquí falsos para mostrarse que yo soy tal, no, no, no. Entonces, tenga cuidado también el amigo que ponerle CISA, él no es CISA, sino es un amigo invitado de nuestra organización. Así que quede claro para todos ustedes, eh, escuchen bien los derechos humanos, respeten a los derechos humanos. Esa es mi recomendación personal para todos ustedes. Gracias. Um, thank you very much, Tomas. Of course, uh, the Indian Council of South America is created by uh, indigenous peoples from South America, from various countries such as Bolivia, Peru, Chile. And they are the original creators of the Consejo Indio de Sudamerica. And uh, we, what Tomas is saying, basically, I have an annual badge of uh, CISA, but this is mainly the body and representatives of those people from South America. So um, in that regard, uh, the Indian Council of South America is really uh, promoting the rights of indigenous peoples, except also people from North America, Oceania, and we are very thankful to uh, the Indian Council of South America because Indian Council of South America takes a strong position and we uh, have to continually fight against puppet governments, puppet individuals coming from indigenous peoples. So it's something that we struggle with all the time, but in that respect, we are very uh, uh, in much in solidarity with uh, CISA. Okay, I, I think all of our panelists have spoken. 
I would like to um, add just one small aspect of the case of Alaska, since I didn't really speak about this, but mainly moderated. And one of the recent developments uh, comes from one of the meetings from the uh, uh, World Conference Against Racism. And it's about the case of Alaska being brought up to the CERD committee, which is the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And it's based on the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination pertaining to Article 15 of the Convention concerning peoples of non-self-governing territories. CERD Committee cannot receive direct petitions from peoples of non-self-governing territories. It has to receive them from another body of the United Nations. One of the things we made clear as a procedural gap in ICERD is that since we cannot do this, this impairs or limits our ability as peoples concerning the Declaration on the Granting of Independence of Colonial Countries and Peoples to directly send from our peoples to the committee. So what we've done is we invoked a procedure under Article 15 where they simply take the petition and transmit it to the United Nations. So we're requesting the body to address this as one of the procedures that need to be enhanced for peoples who have the right of self-determination. So now I'm going to open the question we will uh, uh, for some from the floor for any of you who'd like to ask any of our panelists any questions. Bon, euh, bonjour, je vais parler en français. Euh, J'espère m'être compris. Donc, euh, je souhaite remercier euh, particulièrement tous les intervenants pour la clarté de leur exposé. J'aimerais juste poser une question simple. Euh, avec une définition de l'autodétermination euh, euh, en termes typologiques purs, c'est-à-dire de l'autodétermination, euh, on pourrait aboutir dans le cas palestinien à ce que les à la fois les Israéliens pensent l'occupation comme une autodétermination, hein. pour eux c'est de l'autodétermination, et que les Palestiniens, naturellement, euh, je suis pro-Palestinien, donc euh, ils luttent pour, euh, de manière pacifique euh, pour leur autodétermination. Donc est-ce qu'il ne serait pas plus, plus, plus important, plus pertinent de redéfinir l'autodétermination, non pas en termes euh, comme l'a si bien et clairement euh, d'attitude mais de relations, en termes de relations, euh, de voisinage. C'est-à-dire que euh, le plus grand drame actuel n'est pas du côté des enfants palestiniens, pour moi, mais des enfants israéliens. Parce que eux, comment est-ce qu'ils vont gérer la dissonance cognitive née de la contradiction totale entre l'occupation et, euh, et cette notion théorique ou abstraite de l'autodétermination, comment vivre la paix, ce qu'on enseigne et tout ça, avec euh, les, les décisions de souveraineté sur un autre. Donc euh, ce sont des questions qui gagneraient peut-être, je me pose la question, gagneraient peut-être à être définies de manière relationnelle. C'est-à-dire, euh, parce que l'enjeu dépasse maintenant l'application de certaines conventions. Maintenant c'est une culture qui s'installe, c'est une culture de l'autodétermination destructive. Ce n'est pas de l'autodétermination, c'est de l'autonomie qui suppose la non-autonomie du voisin et la destruction et du voisin, notamment dans le cas palestinien. C'est-à-dire, moi, euh, je, en tant que, que chercheur, j'ai beaucoup de difficultés à, à me mettre à la place d'un enfant israélien, particulièrement, je, je dis bien israélien, parce que c'est lui qui, 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 qui gère le maximum de contradictions. C'est lui, enfin, le bourreau. C'est ça la question que, que je me pose. Merci. Okay. I think that maybe a number of us did not answer the question. Sorry for that. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur, pour votre question. Je réponds en français, sans que votre question en français. Et c'est 
inquiétude euh, par rapport à l'évolution israélien. Euh, oui, oui. On doit penser aussi aux générations qui viennent. La souffrance, c'est vrai, les, les enfants palestiniens, leur souffrance quotidienne. Vous savez, on a 353 ou 35, j'ai oublié pour avoir le, le chiffre exact, des enfants palestiniens moins de 17 ans dans le présent. Alors, juste pour, pour vous le dire, votre inquiétude, des fois, elle va très loin. La deuxième chose, c'est vrai, si on va faire la paix, on doit le faire avec l'autre. L'autre, s'il a vraiment les bonnes intentions de faire la paix. Et là, je vais vous rappeler, Rabbi, lorsqu'il a signé l'accord de, de paix, Rabbi, qui était le, le chef de la guerre 67, lorsqu'il voulait signer l'accord de la paix, avec les Palestiniens, elle était assassinée. Elle était assassinée par un Israélien, pas par un Palestinien. Juste pour, pour vous le dire, lorsqu'il y a la bonne intention et la vraie intention de faire la paix, là, je suis tout à fait d'accord de mettre la main avec l'autre. C'est vrai, la paix, on l'a fait avec l'autre, pas seul. Je suis tout à fait d'accord avec vous. Mais là, on doit penser aussi aux générations palestiniennes. Pourquoi ça continue jusqu'à maintenant la lutte pourquoi ça continue jusqu'à maintenant la résistance Parce que c'est un fer. Parce que ce n'est pas correct qu ce qui se passe. Parce qu'on ferme les yeux par rapport à qu ce qui se passe là-bas. Pourquoi Lorsqu'il s'agit d'Israël, on ferme les yeux. On ferme les yeux parce que, voilà, Israël, les Européens, le sentiment de culpabilité par rapport aux nazis. Le nazi, ce n'est pas nous. C'est l'Allemagne, c'est les Européens. Ce n'est pas nous qui avons fait ça. Voilà. Juste ça, c'est ma question. Et dans ce cas-là, ce n'est pas juste les enfants israéliens, les enfants palestiniens, les gens palestiniens, les femmes palestiniens. On a combien, combien de femmes palestiniens Vous pouvez imaginer 276 femmes mères au présent. On a une fille et sa mère aussi au présent. Excusez-moi. Ok, I'm going to ask you, you know, we have some more questions coming in. Yes, um, that the panel speak not two minutes at the most, because we have to limit this and we have more questions coming. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Je 
veux revenir sur, si vous le permettez, sur l'intervention de M. Mohamed Arkoukou concernant la vie consultative de la Cour internationale de justice. Et je dois d'abord faire observer que la comparaison qu'il a faite entre la Palestine et le Sahara et le Sahara occidental est une erreur parce que ce ne sont pas des situations identiques. Je ne vais pas relater là-dessus parce que c'est très simple. Et puis j'aimerais plutôt revenir sur la Cour internationale de justice en tant que juriste. Vous avez parlé de la souveraineté que la Cour n'a pas reconnue dans son avis euh, la, euh, la souveraineté du Maroc sur le Sahara occidental. C'est vrai, on ne lui a même pas posé cette question, mais il l'a déduit de son raisonnement. Mais j'aimerais tout simplement euh, dire que, et vous a, on a oublié qu'il a dit qu'il existe un lien juridique entre le Maroc et le Sahara occidental. Mais moi, j'ai bien lu l'avis juridique. Malheureusement, tous les éléments nécessaires ne sont pas dans, entre les mains de la Cour internationale de justice. Je vais vous dire, parce que moi, très franchement, je ne suis pas de position politique. Moi, je suis de la partie du Sahara. Could you please pose the question, sir? Could I ask you to pose the question? Here's the issue. If you get 10 judges in a room, they're all going to disagree. And so if you pose the question to the panelists, this would help us. Because we have a limited amount of time. Just less than one minute. Just four okay. comments and what they have. Just a technical issue. So, I continue with the French. It's that I am myself, I am part of the tribune, I can assure you that the relationship between the Sahara and the Sahara de l'État par rapport au nomade, il y a parfois, même dans la région qui est loin du Sahara, il y a des problèmes parfois de l'effectivité de cette autorité, mais ça ne veut pas dire que le, 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 le pays, la centrale, l'autorité centrale n'exerce pas de l'autorité. I think we need to stop at this point. You did not pose a question. Um, we have another panel coming up, so I would like to ask this person. Bonsoir à vous tous et toutes. Merci aux panélistes pour ce beau panel. J'ai beaucoup apprécié l'intervention de Dr. Stuckelberger. Je suis Rania Djiwi de Sahara Occidental, territoire occupé, survivante de la disparition forcée. J'étais disparue avec des centaines de Sahraouis à cause de notre soutien à l'autodétermination et l'indépendance du Sahara occidental. La première fois que j'assiste à un panel que donne à l'aspect psychologique une grande importance. Et je suis prête de collaborer avec vous pour faire une étude là-dedans. Merci infiniment. Ok, one more. Very quickly, go ahead. More turn on your mic. It's it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I like My my question was to the panel this sir, that I'm a British Kashmiri, and I'm proud to be a British Kashmiri, and I'm here from London today. My organization name is Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, and we have been fighting for the independence of my country, which is Kashmir, from Indian occupation. <laughs> My question and sweet and short question to you, sir, is that how much more sacrifices we have to give to achieve the right which has given to us by these nations, sir? That's all my short and sweet answer to you is, sir. Okay. Um, thank you. I will just say two things, um, and then I, say, I know some may want to say something. The exercise of the right to self-determination does include a choice for autonomy, but it also includes a choice to have a level of relationship with the administering power and to sit on the, as a member state in the uh, United Nations, and to still have a strong relationship, or to be completely independent. But when you have states, who reduce your right and force you, it's a violation of the Charter. And it's very simple, because many states do this. 
when you look at the decolonization, it spells out three levels of relationship. So you can have either or, but it's based on the freely expressed wish of the people's concern. So when, when you want to respond to that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to respond to you in English. Uh, to, uh, to your so-called uh, junior experts, I cannot imagine how you still could talk something like that. When you could see uh, clearly that just in 20, uh, February 2017, mm -hmm. we have the European Court that said there is no sovereignty of Morocco over, over the, uh, the, the natural resources of Western Sahara. And said clearly. Same thing. When we had problem with the uh, with, uh, with Syria, we tried to have an uh, offshore drill in Western Sahara, it was also stated clearly that Morocco had no sovereignty over Western Sahara. There is no country in the world whatsoever that recognized that Sahara is part of Morocco or uh, they have sovereignty. None. Zero. Zero. So, okay. Okay. thank you. I would like to conclude. I would like to thank the panelists for the lively discussion. We're going to change, and Mr. Trammell will now be uh, chairing the panel for the remainder of the hour. Thank you, and we will remain in the room to continue the discussion and to uh, invite Mr. Uh, Okay, uh, now I begin the, uh, rather the first part of the proceedings which was delayed because of uh, professor's engagement uh, in the other room uh, where he was presenting his uh, updated uh, report. Uh, so we got uh, about uh, delayed on account of that. Now I begin the plenary session. Uh, again, once again, I welcome you all to this very special <coughs> session, which is hosted by Iram and Sisa as a tribute to Professor Alfred Desais. Professor Desais has been an independent expert on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order. Now for six years, he served the mandate with utter dedication and integrity. His association with civil society, including non-governmental organizations community, is impeccable. Iran is proud to have you as a member of the board. Just before you joined as professor, the expert panel had a glance to review your excellent work over the years as the mandate holder. All of us are overwhelmed that you believe a culture of peace requires education for peace. Everyone should be educated in compromise, cooperation, empathy, solidarity, compassion, restoration, mediation, and reconciliation. And that this culture of peace entails a strategy to identify and remove obstacles, among which are arms race, unilateralism, and the tendency to apply international law a la carte. These are your own words. My own words, I recognize. <laughs> Among various other issues, you have reported on lack of democratic participation by indigenous and unrepresented peoples and nations, which is directly related to their right to self-determination. You are valiant to ask the General Assembly to revisit the reality of self-determination in today's world. You have proposed to reintroduce the right to self-determination as an agenda item in the HRC work and to conduct a follow-up 
study on the modalities of achieving self-determination of in uh, in independent and unrepresented peoples and nations, indigenous and unrepresented peoples and nations. You have openly recommended to refer the special committee on decolonization and or other UN institutions, communications by indigenous and unrepresented peoples wherever they re reside, including Alaska and Kashmir. I personally am a native of Kashmir. UN promised a self-determination through 1947-48 resolutions. 70 years on, none have been enforced till date. Human rights to peace is in shambles in Indian held Kashmir, unfortunately. In the name of security, Kashmir or Kashmiris are subjected to gross human rights violations, including the use of pallet guns, through which Kashmiri youth is killed, maimed, and blinded. Professor Alfred desires humanity in general and we Kashmiris in particular are indebted to you for raising our issues and we take our hats off to him for the excellent work that he has delivered over the years. That concludes my intervention but I would want to add a couple of more words and in terms that we understand John Ziegler had to go to Paris as a result of which he couldn't be here, but he sends his warm greetings and indeed his appreciation for the work that you have carried out over the last six years. Now I will, uh, of course, uh, we have three uh, presentations of video messages or two? Um, I, I don't think we have any, I do have a message from Alaska. Okay, you have messages. Okay, so which uh, Mr. Barnes will read uh, over. But first of all, I will give now the floor to our very distinguished guest, Dr. Iktidar Chima, who is a member of the UN Advisory Committee. Uh, Dr. Chima, please, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Sitting next to Alfred is a great honor. I serve on the United Nations Advisory Committee uh, on Prevention of Genocide and Atrocity Crimes, um, which is headed by Under Secretary General Gamaliel. Yeah. And uh, oh, friend. yes, um, and uh, you know, it was our meeting day before yesterday, um, where uh, under the instructions of Secretary General, we put down three of us to be going to the Global Study Committee. But wherever I go and talk about Alfred, um, Alfred is immediately recognized. Only this morning I was talking to Ibrahim Salamo and we know the chief of the treaty. Yeah, the chief chief of treaties and uh, he was saying why well, you are here today. Uh, I said uh, you know, about you that very good tribute. And he said he is the real man of the passion. I think it's very <coughs> inspiring for all of us that yes, there are people the international system today, <coughs> in the UNR, uh, UN and UNHRC, who raise the concern, who talk about the people. At the launch of our uh, plan of action for prevention of uh, atrocity crime and violence in July of last year, chaired by the Secretary General himself, I raised this that when the first UN consultative meeting happened in San Francisco, it said, we the peoples. Yes. But we and I think probably have moved on from the people. And we wouldn't find a lot of UN rabbit holes and we wouldn't find a lot of UN leaders who would talk about peoples anymore. But thank you very much, sir, that you always talk about the people and their right of self determination. It is obviously a very difficult job, and uh, who knows better than me. Uh, when uh, member states would send long notes of uh, disagreement to the advisory board, and sometimes even they will send notes that why you there at the UN advisory board in the first place. Um, so I fully understand uh, that how difficult it is, but 
I think for all of us who are juniors in uni, uh, who have probably some more year to go, to be inspired um, by the people like yourselves. I think one of the things which uh, member states are forgetting, and some of the leadership in the UN also, is this. That the UN came later, the right of people, including the right of self-determination, came first. And I often remind people that in 1941, when the Atlantic Charter and the Mordenau proposal was there, the one of the core principles was right of self-determination, which resulted into the independence of more than 100 states from 1943 to 1972. But now, uh, this right of self-determination is often uh, forgotten uh, because it doesn't serve the purpose of uh, various nations and uh, it doesn't serve some different purposes. But when we talk about the self-determination, uh, people often forget that referendum or plebiscite is uh, external self-determination and the final stage of self-determination. But first comes internal self-determination, which is about the participatory approach. By giving people the right to decide where they want to live, what would be the system of their economy, which country they want to live, whether they want to constitute their own state. When that right of internal self-determination is denied, then the ultimate solution is external self-determination. Now, looking at, uh, because I can see the audience from Kashmir, and, and I would like to talk about their interests particularly. <coughs> Kashmir was always an independent state, uh, and first annexed by the Mughals, and then by the British, and then sold to someone like animals and cattle, unfortunately. And then uh, what happened, that's a history. But today we should remind those who are denying Kashmiris the right of self-determination that it wasn't the Kashmiris who have made commitments to right of self-determination in the United Nations. Hence, I would like to read a uh, few of the quotes uh, for the perpetrators of violence and those who are denying Kashmiris the right of self-determination. On November 2nd, 1947, the Prime Minister Nehru reiterated, we have declared that the fate of Kashmir is ultimately to be decided by the people. That pledge we have given and Maharaja supported it, not only to the people of Kashmir, but to the world. We will not and cannot back out of it. So that is from the first Prime Minister of India, which is assuring the people of Kashmir that you would have a right of self-determination. And likewise, we have a reflection from uh, Mr. Ayangar, who was uh, Indian delegate of the United Nations. Uh, at, at that Security Council on 15th of January 1948, he said, the Indian independent, when the Indian Independence Act came into force, Jammu and Kashmir, like other states, became free to decide whether it would be acceded to the one or the other of the two dominions or remain independent. So the right of self-determination and the initial commitment is actually from the state of India, which it is consistently denying. And we should also remind uh, the, the government of India and its representative that Security Council on 1st of March 1951, they represented there stating the people of Kashmir are not mere cattle to be disposed of according to the rigid formula. Their future must be decided on their own interest and in accordance with their own desires. So I think we need to send this back to that very government that you have denied Kashmiris their right of internal self-determination first, and then you are consistently denying them their right of external self-determination. And it is such a democracy, and if I would just start on it, I would spend whole time on it. But those who are more interested should uh, read my report, published last year by United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, about the constitutional and legal challenges faced by the uh, minorities in India. I have a few of the copies and I would be happy to share that. Now, as somebody, our professor, who is an expert, was talking about militancy or freedom struggle, uh, after 9-11, a lot of things have changed and people have failed to distinguish between the freedom struggle, armed struggle and terrorism. But I would like to raise some questions today. That armed struggle or militancy of Freedom fight was always covered under the international conference, but now it is often misinterpreted 
as Stalinism. But people should remember that the, the years and years of armed struggle in Eritrea, if that armed struggle wasn't there, they would have never achieved any independence. People should also remember the Albanians of Kosovo, that how they achieved independence. And people should remember that Russian military attack and the conflict uh, in Chechnya. So all that armed struggle <coughs> was legitimate to make few states independent and lead towards their external right of self-determination. But when it comes to Kashmir today, it is often narrated as terrorism. Obviously, terrorism is there, but it is not on the part of the people of Kashmir, but on the part of the state of India, which is sponsoring state-led terrorism. Now, share, share. the most concerning the most concerning thing, I think, at the moment is that Indian government is not only violating the human rights in the region, but it is trying to change the demography of Kashmir by bringing in people who are non-Kashmiris into a region so that if at some stage a plebiscite or a referendum does happen, it changes the demography, but they should refer to the situation of, of Western Sahara, for instance, where the United Nations has said that non-Saharabis who were being settled in Sahara would not be recognized as people, indigenous people and will have no role in any referendum. So that, that is very, very concerning in the way the current Indian government and the previous governments are consistently trying to, to settle people from other parts of India into Kashmir to change the demography. Sir and my dear listeners, when we talk about Kashmir, don't appreciate that how important it is for the Kashmir to be independent because Kashmir is a nuclear flashpoint. You have three nuclear states around Kashmir. Pakistan is a nuclear state, China is a nuclear state, and India is a nuclear state. State of India or the country India has fought two wars with both <coughs> India and Pakistan. And if there will be another conflict in the region, that can escalate a nuclear war, which is not conducive for humanity and not conducive for the world peace. Hence, it is very important that the matter of Kashmir should be resolved for the world peace, not only for the Kashmiris, but for the world peace. The only solution for South Asian peace or the peace in that region is that we need to have more buffer states in the region, which split the borders of India and Pakistan because both the states have fought with each other so many times. And right of self-determination should not only be extended to Kashmiris, but also to the people of Eastern Punjab who have faced genocide from 1984 to 1994 and a lot of atrocity crimes. It should also be extended to the seven sister northeastern states of India. If India calls itself a democracy, it shouldn't shy away from the right of self-determination. The country I come from, United Kingdom, has given right of self-determination to its population very decently twice. In case of Scottish referendum and in case of a vote on whether we want to be in European Union or not. That's what democracy means. Democracy does not mean a majoritarian rule where the majority can implement its own sets of principles of democracy on minorities and slum people by the ones are by sending 100,000 military who consistently murdering, martyring, and violating human rights in Kashmir. That's not what we call democracy. Rather, I would call it shambled democracy, and that's the real place of India today, which world is consistently ignoring, because in today's world, there are very few countries who follow ethical foreign policy. There are very few states who are voice for the people. There are very few states who will put their trade and commercial interests behind the human rights agenda. What we must not forget about Kashmir, that Kashmir is bigger than 121 independent countries today when it comes to an area and when it comes to population, it is bigger than 170 nations of the world. Hence, Kashmir is not a piece of land. It's the people's right and Kashmiris have every legitimacy <coughs> to demand it. Thank you.
your contribution at the UN level is indeed uh, overwhelming and great, and uh, your continuous support, uh, like I've emphasized, is very crucial to the concept of uh, right to self determination, including uh, the Kashmiri people's right to self determination. We very much uh, welcome it, and we very much. Needed in the future as well, and we hope that this award of yours will continue. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have, uh, before we move on to the substantive um, intervention from the podium, uh, Mr. Our Ambassador Barnes will read some messages from Alaska. Then Mr. Yasser Ahmed will read a message, or or will. These are all for you, Matt. Yes. They are all for you. Thank you. And I have a little statement to make at the end. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have all this time to yeah. make a statement. Good, okay. good. Yeah. Okay, Alfred, if you look back on the screen. Yes, it is. Got the screen yes. Yeah. 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 This is from Mary oh, and yes. the group that invited you to Alaska. In Kenaitzi. Yes, Kenaitzi. It is with deep gratitude that I offer words of honor to a man of impeccable integrity, Alfred Desires. You touched the hearts of many tribal leaders when you accepted our invitation to Alaska and met with us during the National Congress of American Indians in Anchorage, Alaska in 2013. Thank you for guiding us through the international processes and providing information vital to our efforts to maintain and revitalize our cultures, languages, and to restore human dignity to our tribal courts. We must constantly assert our right to be in the lands that we have had for 15,000 years, which without resources, due to the theft of our lands, makes your kindness and willingness to assert and to assist us in a, is a story we will tell for generations. Thank you for your humbleness as you met with leaders and chiefs from throughout the United States of America to understand the human rights abuses we face every day. Thank you for standing up for the four Alaska Native men known as the Fairbanks Four, and you probably recall this, who were wrongly accused of murder because they were easy targets, teenagers, and meeting with their chiefs and leaders during the 2013 National Congress of Men and Indians Conference. I am happy to report to you that after spending 20 some years in prison, the Fairbanks Four have been exonerated and released from prison. Unfortunately, as a condition of their release, they had to sign a waiver saying they would not sue for their wrongful incarceration and conviction. Thank you for your integrity and keeping high standards of your work on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order <coughs> and the excellence reports you submitted to the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights and for the recommendation to send Alaska and Hawaii to the United Nations Decolonization Committee for you. You are an honorable man in a time when the world sorely needs people of high moral standards in its governing body. Thank you for making the world a better place. Thank you for Alaska for making the job. And this is written specifically by Mary Ann Walsh. Thank you as one of the All right. Yes. yes. <laughs> also, Leon, you had sent a video from the grounds of the Iolani Palace. Unfortunately, we couldn't open it properly. <laughs> so, technology. Yes. So he says, thank you from the grounds of the Iolani Palace. I've been to Hawaii. I felt the spirit and the presence of their movement uh, from their uh, last sovereign, Queen Liliaokala. And so what he says is thank you, too. A very heartfelt thank you for the recommendation to send Hawaii to the Decolonization Committee. And thank you. And he also wants to say to you, we also want to continue to work together. And we appreciate everything you have done. So, and then lastly, of course, from myself, 
You are my good friend, of course. <laughs> and will remain so. And we will remain good friends. You are a big brother to me. Um, I am very uh, honored and pleased to know you. And I'm glad that you helped not only us, but many other cases and situations. What you did, and I think you realize this, it was very courageous. Because you came at a time when the United Nations Many states were trying to suppress many experts, the former Subcommission on Human Rights, mm -hmm. and many independent experts and special rapporteurs became frightened and scared. They diminished their voices, and instead of this, because of what I call your fierce independence in my intervention earlier this week, and of course us working together to get political support, uh, of course, the Myself and others. Um, I wish uh, uh, Michelin was in here because she was also uh, yeah, gave an effort to give you some political support from NGOs. And of course, you had a number of states that backed you very strongly. So, with that, we thank you very much for not only the recommendation to send us, which keeps alive the question of the right to self determination substantively but also to recommend that we deal equally with states as nations, as peoples, as unrepresented peoples who still assert that we have the right to self-determination. So Alfred, thank you very much. Well, uh, oh, can you switch off the stick? Thank yes. you very much, uh, Ambassador Barnes. Now I will take you to Kashmir. Thank you. Then I hope to go there one day. <laughs> the, um, and before that, before I forget, uh, some of you are familiar with report A slash 69 slash 272, which is my report on self-determination, which has been cited enormously by our friends, the Tamils, the Sarawis, uh, so the Catalans, etc. I have about 20 copies. If anybody wants to have it, if you are not, for instance, I hate the internet and I hate having to read <laughs> online. I mean, I like a piece of paper where I can make a little note on the margin. So if anybody wants them, I have 20 copies here. Thanks. Good, thank you, sir. And now to Kashmir. Now to Kashmir. Um, you know, we now uh, refer you to Dr. Mirwais Muhammad Umar Farooq. You have met him within this building. Uh, he is the chairman of all parties Hurriyat Conference, which is a freedom conference. It's a grassroots uh, coalition of pro-freedom parties in Indian-held Jammu and Kashmir. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Mirwais has constantly tried to raise the awareness about the Kashmir issue internationally. He was also shown among the Asia's heroes by the Time uh, magazine of the United States. But what is more crucial is that uh, uh, Professor Desai says that uh, the, the, the people of Kashmir, through him and through the Hurriyat Conference, remember you all the time and quote your names in every nook and corner of Kashmir. And uh, really, this is his uh, 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 tribute to you, which he would have wished to do if he was permitted to come here. Mm -hmm. uh, he is currently under house arrest. His travel document, together with all other Kashmiri leaders, have been denied by the national, present nationalist government of India. So he can't move out of his house. None of the Kashmiri leaders can travel from Kashmir to any part of the world. But he has a... Uh, uh, managed a small message for you, which I hope you will find very, very interesting. Can we have the message, please? We'll, we'll, we'll come to that, sir. Uh, Dr. Alfred Desaius is being paid respectful tribute for his iconic contribution to the concept of self-determination. I, on behalf of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Alfred desires for creating a hope in the people living in conflict situations. He is very apt 
when he expounds the idea that for avoiding violence, granting self-determination is the best conflict-preventing strategy. The people of Jammu and Kashmir are caught in a conflict for the last seven decades. Presently, the situation in Kashmir is grossly critical. We are experiencing the absence of all the fundamental freedoms and basic rights. From the bloom of dead eyes to everyday mayhem is a challenge for the international conscience. We hope our quest for self-determination will be supported by the same voices like Dr. Alfred desires. Thank you, Dr. Alfred, and thank you all. Good. That was uh, Dr. Mirbai Zumad, uh, Muhammad Umar Farooq. As my friend raised the issue here, there are all other leaders who are sending you their good wishes, uh, including uh, uh, Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, who is our uh, most uh, elderly leader, and together with Muhammad Yasin Malik, and of course, Farooq Ahmad Dar, uh, who is currently detained at Tihar Jail in New Delhi. Uh, that uh, is that. Now we move on to you. My question to you, Al Alfred Desais, is where we go from here now that you are not there? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, be sure, and I promise, uh, I will not waver uh, in my commitment to support your cause, as I will not waver in my commitment to support uh, the legitimate rights and aspirations of hundreds of peoples who have been denied this very fundamental right of self-determination. And I keep saying it's not right to self-determination sometime in the future, but as Article 1 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and of the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights says very clearly the right of, of self-determination, which by now it's quite clear who are the rights bearers, all peoples, and that means all peoples. Who are the duty bearers? The states. And it simply cannot be frustrated or trumped by saying, oh, territorial integrity, that's sacred. It isn't. You know very well that territorial integrity is not secret, uh, uh, not sacred, and every time you look at uh, the use of the term in United Nations resolutions, is always in connection with the prohibition of the use of external force. So territorial uh, integrity is a norm of international law that prohibits state A from coming into state B but it does not prohibit the people within a state to demand greater autonomy or deny independence if greater autonomy will not satisfy their human rights. I mean, that is clear any good faith interpretation of the Vienna Declaration and uh, Program of Action of Resolution 2625 will lead you to this conclusion. But of course, States say, oh no, stability. States say, oh no, you know, our frontiers are sacred. They have never been sacred. It's a question of negotiating with your own people, the people who are on your jurisdiction. And if you don't do so, you are violating their human rights, period. Now, the matter should be elevated to the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion that would further clarify this. And I am persuaded that the International Court of Justice would say what I'm saying. On the other hand, uh, I haven't seen any group of states wanting to elevate the question to the ICJ in order to have uh, clarity. Yes. Now, my report, uh, 2014 to the General Assembly, was entirely devoted to the right of self-determination and it formulates the criteria for claiming self-determination. Now, 
This report happily has been used quite a bit. And it's being used today, for instance, by uh, the Catalans. And it is being used also by the Kurds. And it's being used by the Sahrawis. <coughs> In my final report, the one that uh, I just presented to, to this side event uh, an hour ago, there I formulate 23 principles of international order. And one of those, of course, is the right of self-determination. And uh, the report A slash HRC slash 37 slash 63, which you can get uh, upstairs in floor two uh, in the document uh, section, uh, also has a whole section on self-determination. So I, I make references to what I've already written in prior reports, but then I refine it in this final report as kind of a legacy. Now, I continue and will continue to call for the creation of the mandate of a special rapporteur on self-determination. I will also continue uh, demanding that at the next uh, organizational meeting of the council that they make self-determination a permanent item of the agenda as it used to be in the commission. And uh, there was no justification to drop it. The right has not been exercised by hundreds of aspirants. And yours, of course, is a very old self-determination claim and a very strong claim based on resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly. Uh, but self-determination is going to occupy the international community for decades and decades. As the African population becomes better educated and uh, realize the injustices that colonialism imposed upon them, and the absurdities of the drawing of frontiers, not taking into account regions, not taking into account religious uh, groups or ethnic groups uh, or uh, linguistic groups, but just simply splitting them across. We already have quite a bit of problems with the Anglophone population of the Cameroons, for instance. Mm -hmm. As these people come of age and have education, one of the first things they're going to demand is self-determination. Yeah. We'd better be ready for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the United Nations cannot stick its head in the sand as if this had been just finished back in the 1960s and 70s, and we don't have to talk about it anymore. And another group, I mean, my heart goes out to them, the Kurds, you have 45 million Kurds split into four countries. And since the uh, Treaty of Sèvres and the Treaty of Lausanne, they have been completely left behind. Nobody cares them. They get massacred by the Turks. Nobody cares. I mean, it's a scandal how the Human Rights Council mm -hmm. is selective. It picks and chooses some things. Uh, yeah, they have their, shall we say, consensus victims. They are politically correct victims. And then there are the other victims you can safely ignore. And the Kurds are among them. And not only can you ignore the claims of the Kurds, you even call them terrorists. <laughs> the same thing with claimants like the Tamils. They've been massacred, the terrorists. And the, same, the game is being played here on the third floor. And I, I must say, one of the great disappointments of my six years as an in, independent expert was to realize uh, the level of hypocrisy in the system and the fact that we are surrounded by what I call condottieri, mercenaries of human rights. There is a human rights industry that is subservient to lobbies, subservient to the uh, transnational corporations that are the donors who pay. And so they are arguing what is of interest to those donors. 
So you're, you're coming into a situation that the only human rights that are really being advanced are the business-friendly human rights. Yeah. And uh, I must say in my discussions with diplomats and uh, with missions, I realized that they also know this, but nothing changes. Even though the diagnosis is clear, there's no indication that uh, this very unhealthy situation is about uh, to be changed. Now, going back to my mandate, I've had the honor, the pleasure, the privilege to administer this mandate as the first mandate holder. I've done a total of uh, 13 thematic reports, and I'm now doing a country report concerning my visits to two countries of the ALBA in Latin America, Venezuela and Ecuador. One has the economic model of the Revolución Bolivariana in Venezuela, and Ecuador has the Revolución Ciudadana in Ecuador, both aim, aim at giving economic, and social, and cultural rights uh, a greater force and greater implementation in their respective countries. That will be my uh, final report. But there again, I want to share with you another one of my disappointments. Uh, six weeks before I went uh, to Venezuela, I was attacked by numerous non-governmental organizations. And I was asked not to go because I was not the pertinent rapporteur. Why was I not the pertinent rapporteur? Because I'm independent. The only rapporteurs who are on demand are the rapporteurs who pull the rope. The rapporteurs who will go in a naming and shaming campaign will not make any constructive uh, proposals, will not negotiate with uh, the government to improve the situation on the ground. They will just, from their high horse, condemn the government and grandstand. That's what they all do. And uh, I was even written by several rapporteurs in this direction. And I said, heavens, you know, uh, the very justification the uh, raison d'etre of the system of special procedures uh, is that we have to be independent. The only added value to the function of a special rapporteur is if he acts according to his conscience. He goes, he listens to both sides, audiatur et altera pars, he reaches a uh, conclusion based on facts based on documents, based on the interviews that he conducts. And then he makes constructive proposals. That is what a rapporteur is supposed to be, and not, as I see again and again and again, it is just a litany of <laughs> condemnations against the state without any effort uh, to try to discreetly reach a mediated uh, solution. So my emphasis and my wish is that my successor uh, will go in the direction of negotiation and the direction of dialogue and the direction of mediation. Uh, obviously, he will be independent. He will have the right to have his own opinions, which may be totally different from mine. But of course, he will be bound by the terms of reference of Resolution 18, Bar 6. And I allow myself one last thought there are many things that I could not do. Even in 14 reports, I cannot cover the very vast agenda of Resolution 18, Bar 6. So I allowed myself, not as a roadmap, but at least as a suggestion, that there are many things that I wish I had had the time to study, and that I hope that he might consider important to do himself. Among them, the impact on the international order of the G7, of the G20, of the World Economic Forum, of the Bilderberg, of the Trilateral <coughs> Commission, etc. These are private organs, private uh, organizations that are affecting your lives and my life much more 
than we realize because decisions are taken behind closed doors. I see that the time so is we've got to uh, do one more thing with you. So very you well, very well. In that case, uh, Mose, I thank you for uh, this nice. unexpected, uh, unexpected <laughs> honor. Uh, but you know, when you get an honor, one should accept it with grace. And I must say, I do. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. Professor. And I'm very, very grateful to you for all your support. And our Thank friend you. from Western Mr. Sahara, he also joined us. Thank you. I am Mr. Sahara. I would like yes. to thank you very much for all your efforts. And it's been really I now continue. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. I'm not leaving. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dixon, and thank you for accepting this. One picture, please. Yes. Dixon, can you please take it? Yes, please.